fun. Hi, welcome back to the Hall Monitor of the Universe show. I have a, spe- uh, a, a wildly special guest. Like I, I actually this morning before I went to the salon, I got a little nervous that I was going to talk to you today. Really? This is a big deal for me. Like I found you, I mean, I know, baby, everyone, this is Miss Coco Peru, obviously. Wait, is, no, n- yes. not so obviously. First of all, is that well, do you my husband's name at the bottom there? You Does don't, it share uh-uh. his name? No, no, okay. I don't usually do interviews out of drag. And I think when this you- is my second one out of drag. I'm, 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 I'm a little nervous myself because Aww. I'm to, um, I'm old school that way, and always wanted to keep, you know, my private life and me separate from Coco Peru or, or I, it wasn't so much that it was just that I thought, I always thought the magic of drag was that, um, that visual of Coco Peru is what you wanted to leave people with and that, that she existed in the world and that this was, you know, didn't enter people's minds. It was just Coco. And so, but you know, things evolve and I evolve. And so I decided um, I would just evolve along with you. I was actually really excited because when you said that, I was going to say, don't feel that, because I don't really know about all that, about interviews and you haven't been out. I was going to say, if you don't want to do drag, like you don't, I mean, don't feel like you need to, for me. Yeah, well, you Um, know, it's a lot of work. All that. Girl, the only reason you're seeing any of this is because I went to work and I was like, okay, the, I had clients this morning. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna yeah, pick my tits up, get my shit my together. Point. It's work. <laughs> right. So what, I, I'm just gonna say this and I'll shut up, but okay. I have always, I mean, Trick obviously is a huge gay staple movie. If you guys have not seen Trick, you need to go. It is me and my best friends used to always say it burns. Like, I'm sure you've heard that a million times, but what got me over the pandemic, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to like toot a horn or anything, but I found you on YouTube and it was through the, the Grand Theft Auto, um, you doing, you playing Grand Theft Auto. If you guys have not seen that, you need to look it up on YouTube. I laughed so hard. And then, so I started to to troll you, I guess, on YouTube and watching you go into thrift stores and and all these places. Some of them kick like the Kmart, some of them kicking you out. And I was like, oh my God, this person is going in in full drag into these stores in Van Nuys. I mean, and I lived in Van Nuys, so I know, baby, mama, I know Van Nuys. Like I know that part of LA. And like, I was like, oh my God, I want to know this person. Like I... And I, it was kind of sort of a journey for me because prior to that, prior to the pandemic, I always kind of, I would do drag, but I would never dress in female clothes as a boy, right? And so I started to do that during the pandemic. I think a lot of people kind of had realizations during the pandemic, but. That's great. Yeah, There's one more cross-dresser because of you, I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> I, I never, um, I never had, well, maybe I was courageous, let's say that in that, even when I lived in New York and I would ride the train and pull drag, um, I, I, if there was any fear that I had, I just, the empowerment that I felt was so outweighing any fear that there was almost no fear. However, the few times I did ride the train in New York with maybe just the face on, yeah, that's when I would be bullied. Mm-hmm. But when I did the whole thing, there was a level of respect that was paid to me. And I learned that at a very early age, that like really just put, putting it out there, um, there was a respect that, and I, this is a s- story. Um, years ago, when I first started doing Coco, friends of mine and I drove into like the upstate part of New York to go to a gay club. And I went as Coco. No one knew who I was because I hadn't done anything at that time, just my own one person show down in New York. And when we left, they wanted to go to a diner. And I said, I don't think this is a smart idea. I mean, I'm in drag and we're in the woods. Yeah. (laughs) But they were like, it's, you know, we're hungry. So we pull into this diner and I walk in and 
everyone in the restaurant, including the owner, they were giving me dirty looks. And I was so uncomfortable, but I sat down and they sat us right next to a table of like guys that were maybe 18, 19, 20 years old who had been drunk. And that was my first experience of like that kind of masculine, that toxic masculinity that kicked in with them where they almost became like a pack of wild dogs feeding off of this energy. And they were so disturbed and yet titillated by my presence. Yeah. Uh huh. That one of them couldn't contain his energy, this like wild energy that he literally took his face and threw it into his like burger and fries and ketchup and was just like, <laughs> and like came up with all this food dripping off his face. It was crazy. Oh my fucking and God. That it is was crazy. throwing food at me. No. So my two friends were getting like really angry. They were not in drag. And I said, I thought there's going to be a fight here. This is going to get ugly. So I said to my friends, listen, your only responsibility is to me right now. Mm -hmm. And I am dressed as a woman. I am a woman right now. And you will treat me with respect as a woman. And I will, I will act with that myself, you know? And I sat there so dignified while this food was thrown at me. Then the owners kicked them out. Oh, okay, good. And then the next thing that I know, the police show up with this group of five or six guys. Police come up to me and say, were these guys harassing you? I said, yes, they made each of the men stand at the table and apologize to me. The owner had called the police because uh, he thought he might have trouble getting them out. Yeah. And, um, and then as we left, the same people that was still in the restaurant that had given me dirty looks, including the owner. As I walked through that restaurant with my head held high, they all said, good night, dear. Good night, you know, miss, or things like that. And I just, I got in the car and collapsed. I was exhausted, but oh, it taught sure. me that, it did teach me that lesson of like that internal strength of, um, I'm going to behave in a way that warrants a treatment that it, demands respect basically. Mm -hmm. So when I walk into a um, you know Home Depot, I, I walk in there as if this is where exactly where I belong in the world right now. It's in this moment in this Home Depot. Well, and we need to see that, I mean, you had a memory pop back and I used to be so fearless. Like it's so interesting how it, and it, for me, it was like, if I was in drag in full geesh, like everything, you couldn't tell me anything. I would walk anywhere. I was raised in Las Vegas. So we would go into the casinos, walk all around the casinos. I mean, it was so fun, but it's a lot different. I, I don't know. Maybe the way the culture is now, maybe the way politics are now. I, I don't know. I don't know. But we are seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of gender assigned males wearing quote unquote women's clothing now. So I can see where, as you were saying in the beginning, that you were nervous about doing the interview. Well, of course, because it's like a superpower when you're in drag, right? Right. Yeah. And it's it's very, it's when I'm in full, I feel like I also cannot be like fucked with. Like it's like who or, you're gonna yeah. fuck with me, you know? And it's always been for me trying to connect to that as myself. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what drag did for me. It it healed that part of me that was so damaged. And I don't think it's, I'm not saying it's healed me 100%. <laughs> I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> Same. But it gave me a, an opening into um, possibilities and finding my voice again mm -hmm. and realizing that <clears throat> in the same way I created Coco, that that we have that gift to be able to create our lives. And I do believe that a lot of the reason why so many people um, hate us is because they uh, resent that we have that power. They have that power too. They just don't, they have so many fears of their own. Right. That, that when you walk out into the world dressed like that, you're, you're making them have to confront their own fears about being authentic 
In fact, yesterday I was in an Aldi out in Northridge. Okay, there was a I know Northridge. Beautiful young boy who walked in and he was wearing makeup. And um, I, we had already paid for our groceries. And I said to my husband, I said, I have to go find him. Aww. And um, so I walked back and he was online paying for his groceries. And I said, darling, I just have to tell you, you look beautiful. I love your makeup. And he was like, thank you. You know, and then I left. But um, I loved seeing it. I do love seeing kind of how things, I think we can stay so much on the negative a lot, which there is a lot of negative going on. I'm not saying that, but I, I am excited for these kids because I, th I hopefully think with the birth of like, you know, the social media avenues and everyone being able to kind of watch what they want to watch now that and I mean, we can, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race, of course, started all of that genre, but I think there's something bigger happening, especially with like trans, non-binary people that, you know, like for me, for instance, I just don't even want to like identify as anything. I just want to be me and be kind of like left alone in the sense, right? But I get kind of told by the way I dress, because sometimes it's provocative, whatever, that like, well, you're asking for it. It's like, okay, well, I'm not, I, I just want to be cute. Like, and I'm not yeah. asking for anything, right. but with the men, and I find this more often than not that have issues with me are the ones that want to fuck me. Like, that's what I kind of like find in the mix or, or they want to wear my shoes, my high heels or my skirts or my bras. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've been on Grindr where this hot guy's talking to me. And then all of a sudden they're like, so what size shoes do you wear? What, what's the, and I'm like, oh, they don't, they don't wanna, they don't wanna get with me. They want like my wigs and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I've, I've had those experiences and I, I, it certainly um, opens the, my eyes to, just how much more fluid yeah. uh, sexuality and expression, how, how fluid they are. And, um, you know, a lot of people are hiding um, because they don't feel safe. And I wanted to create a world where um, people could feel safe to, to not just, not just um, the, uh, for instance, me, a drag queen, but those who might be attracted to someone like me. Right. Uh, so who, uh, there's a lot of men that are, you know, closeted, mm -hmm. that would be a, terrified to express that openly and feel secure in their manhood or whatever they, you know. Right. Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting ride and it certainly has show, uh, taught me a lot, yeah. uh, not only about myself, but about uh, so much. And I'm still learning, you know, these, I, I really, I really look to young people for, um, you know, advice. And yeah. I've always wanted to have that connection with the younger people because they are, you know, they are creating the world they want to live in now. No, totally. I tell the girls at work, they're all so young and I'm like, some of them will be they're all so freaking cute and right. they'll say they're they'll say they're fat and i look at them i'm like listen to me oh uh, this, this is the skinniest you will ever be with the the less <laughs> amount of work that you'll ever have to you know what i'm saying like i used to go out and pound liquor get jack in the box and then rinse and repeat in my 20s and i stayed thin but there was a point where it stopped and i used to think that i was fat that I had something hanging over and I'm like god if I could just wake up my yes. younger self and be like yes. bitch this is the best you're gonna look right now yes like yes. do what you, you want to do I I I used to think that as Coco when I was young that I was not like attractive or pretty or um and I I, wish I could go back in time and certainly that stemmed from uh always feeling ugly uh, mm -hmm. growing up. There was a certain point in my gr growing up years where um, I couldn't even look in the mirror or it was, I could only look like at this part of me, you know, I, it was just so disconnected. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so yeah i can i can relate to those young people that go through that stuff and i too tell them oh honey let it go you have to you're wasting so much precious youth and time and energy and brain cells worrying about it yeah well and i love what you said that it was, I put it in that article that I wrote, but you said something to the effect of, I'm paraphrasing it, but if that person is making fun of you, like you're walking around and someone's making fun of you, let them, because at least they're laughing in the day. And I, I it wasn't exactly that. I, sorry guys, I am totally butchering it probably, but the, the gist of it for me was like, oh my God, why do I, why do I like notice that? Why shouldn't I just like move along and just, you know? I, I just don't, I've always, I, because I internalized so much of the bullying and then ended up believing on some level my bullies. Oh, of course. Uh, and it just, it, I was frozen. I was so frozen. I mean, I remember one day being so frozen that I literally couldn't move yeah. on my couch. And I was little, you know. And um, so I just don't want young people to internalize any of that stuff. So if you're, if someone's laughing at you, well, you've taken them out of the reality, you gave them a laugh for the day. Um, you know what? You gave them a blessing. Send them on their way. Don't yeah. internalize it. And so many people identify with victimhood. And that can become a bad habit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah so. when, when was... I was gonna, I wanted to ask you this, like, what was, did you have a moment like in your career where you were like, okay, this is, this is it, or this like, or you, how about this? There was a moment in your career where you're like, okay, I, this is like, I've made it like this or somewhere where I was at, where like for me, not I've made it, but like when I moved to LA, I was doing acting here and there. I started to do background acting. And I ended up picking up a day on Star Trek Picard. And I'm like obsessed. Okay, so obsessed. And that day, I mean, I was very like leaving there thinking, oh my God, I, this is it. This was it, right? I mean, what follows that in LA is like, oh, I want that. For me, at least, I want that again. I want that again. I want that again. And that's like kind of my life. Like, oh my God, that was a wonderful thing. Let's try and find that again. And I never find it. But for you, is was there like a moment where you're like, oh my God, like I can't believe I'm I'm here right now? I've had many moments like that. You have what? And I've had many moments like okay. that. Okay. And so I don't think that you ever get to a point in your life where you think, oh, I've made it. Okay, right, right, right. Because um, I remember being invited to do a, an AIDS benefit in New York City by an older drag queen. I was really young and it was called Teddy Cares and Ruby Rims was the drag queen. And, mm -hmm. and I remember I went to the pay phone and called my mother so excited that I had been asked to do this benefit. Yeah. That I had been invited as a guest star into someone else's show. Yeah. And, um, and so I thought at that time, you know, wow, I've, I've made it, you know? And then I remember meeting Liza Minnelli and her wanting to be friends with me and thinking, uh, you know, get going to her apartment for a party and thinking, wow, sitting here in Liza's, there's the, the Oscar, I've made it. Yeah. You know, um, so many moments like that. Definitely when I saw a trick for the first time in San, uh, I thought, it, it, it's not so much that I've made it, but I almost felt like, when I made the decision to, to create Coco, it was outrageous to me that I would do drag because okay. I had been trained in the theater and all they ever taught me was I needed to butch up and lose my Bronx <clears> accent. <throat> and here I was sort of gonna embrace both of those and, and just push it to the limit. But I found so much freedom and creativity in, in that decision that I felt like the universe, and this is, you know, woo, but I really felt like there was something beyond me that was pushing me in that direction and saying, yes, this is it. You, you are finally on your path. So every time I had one of those moments where a dream would come true, I felt like it was the universe saying, told yourself, you know, right. and just supporting me. And when I did 
um, Will and Grace, oh, the most yeah. recent one. There were moments when I, they would want to pick me up and on a little cart and drive me from the parking lot where we had to park to the studio where it's we a would far, That's a far trek too, I think. Yeah, but I, I always <laughs> refused the drive <laughs> because there was something so magical that a gay kid from the Bronx who at one time believed was so frozen on my couch with fear I couldn't move, thinking there's no future for me. Right. And here I'm on a Hollywood famous lot being celebrated. I wanted to walk through that Universal Studio lot, just taking it all in. Yeah. And um, yeah, I love those moments. And you're right, you, it does leave you wanting more. Um, I'm fortunately at a place in my life where, <clears throat> yes, I want those moments, but I also just feel so incredibly grateful for my career up to this point that um, if it doesn't, if nothing like that ever happens again, I feel like I've been so blessed that I at least had those moments. Right. Yeah. I remember when I met, because I met, we, Tracy is our mutual friend. When I met Tracy, I was doing her hair and she, the first time I was ever on a set set was to come see a taping. And this was years and years ago. And I remember we came on, we got to meet everybody. It was an amazing experience. I mean, I was just, I mean, that's a show I grew up watching. I mean, it was the first time I heard certain words said. It was the first time I heard jokes being said that I was like, are we allowed to say these jokes? Absolutely type of thing. Um, and we walked back. I remember they tried to give us a ride back and me and my best friend said, no, we wanna walk. And we did, we walked that whole lot all the way down, but it was lovely. It was lovely. Yeah. Being there was lovely. Being on it years a year later was I. It was like pinch me. I couldn't believe that I was like able to do it right before it being done. I do think Will and Grace is like up there with like top three for me favorite TV shows. It was the best. Right. And your episode, the first one, weren't you out of drag in the first one? I was for a brief moment, and then um, on a phone I, call. It was a phone call in which uh, we all had our own little set in a circle with our own camera pointing at us. <clears throat> and so we filmed it, you know, like that. And then um, they took a break where, you know, they then did, I did my makeup and then they came back to me, you know, throwing on the wig. And it was supposed to appear like I had done my makeup in like, eight seconds of that opening shot. I, and I said, you know, drag queens across America are not gonna like buy that. <laughs> so I suddenly have a face full of makeup. And uh, well, the magic of Hollywood. Hollywood, yes. yeah. It's always so fucking cold. But nobody, nobody ever, I mean, a couple of people said that, but nobody cared. They were just happy to see me on, a, on that TV show. Yeah. Yeah. And it was funny too, I realized after that, the power of television because I would be on, uh, I remember one time I was on a cruise and someone came up to me and was like, Coco Peru? And I said, oh my God, yes. How do you, like, how do you even know me? And I, I said, did you see one of my shows? You know, and they were like, no, we saw you on uh, Arrested Development. I thought, you God. Were on that? Yeah, but like, for, again, for like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, I had a little scene and, uh, you know, they remembered my name. I, and I thought, wow, television's powerful. Well, that also shows how powerful you are, I think. Like, I think you kind of, you, I, I don't think you well, in on this. You know, thank you. But I, I think that they were just an uber fan of that show and so right, right, right. knew everything about it. Yeah. I wish, I wish Will and Grace was still going on. That would have been. Me too. I yeah. loved being a regular. It was, it's a fun little, it was a fun little, um, did they do three seasons again? Yeah, it was. I think so, yeah. And I think I was on for the last two. And and um, what, it, what it gave me and what I crave, first of all, being a solo performer, I love being able to step out of that and work with other people. But you're working with everyone who's at the top of their game. I 100%. mean, there's no room for, Flake, flakiness, like, not at all. Because there's people waiting in the wings ready to take your job. Absolutely, and, all and four when you, of them. Go ahead. Yeah, them, and I mean, 
caterers, hair people, everybody, all the tech people, they're all at the top of their game. And, and, and because of that, it, it offers you this safety, but also it makes you have to operate at the top of your game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I had all the tremendous fears. Uh, Sean was wonderful with me. Oh, so calming good. me down and just being like, girl, you know, relax. People, we fuck up our lines all the time. You don't have to be perfect. It's being filmed. And, and once I did that initial first line, I was, okay, I can get, I can do this. But yeah. Um, yeah, so I miss that because believe me, when you're out on the road and you're working with you know, people who show up to your tech late or they don't know how to operate the machine, you know, it, it can be very frustrating. So to, to work with people who are all at that level for yeah. me was a gift. Yeah. Did you ever get to work with uh, Leslie Jordan? No, not on that. Uh, not on that show. I okay. worked with Leslie on something else. Cool. Yeah. And he was my, the fa my favorite part about being around Leslie was not the actual work. It was the uh, you know sitting sitting with him because he was a great storyteller. Oh, so but one of yeah. my close friends was very close with him. So like we had a chit chat, we got to talk. And yeah. He was telling me some really funny stories. Yeah. About. I like when I he had an interview where he talked about being on <laughs> being on Star Trek and he didn't like know it was like a day player thing. And he was like a Ferengi and the director's like, why are you talking like that? He's like, well, I just talk like this. Like, what do you how do you want me to talk? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, God, talk about really someone that's always been them. Yeah, I remember when my first job here in Hollywood, um, I got it because the the casting people and one of the producers had seen Trick and they loved me. So they had me come in to audition for this part and I got it and I was so excited. And so I show up on TV on the set. And of course I'm from the theater and I'm a drag queen. So I don't, I don't understand that. Um, and I auditioned being big. Yeah, and the so I show up on set and I'm just being really broad. And rather than what, see, when I auditioned for that Will and Grace spot years ago, um, the casting director was so wonderful because she said to me, she said, uh, just bring it down a notch, like bring it down a notch, like let's talk from here. And, you know, and, and the, she helped me. Yeah. But the director on this set uh, came up to me and, and the lead actress didn't like me. It was really an ugly experience, but um, it was horrible. And at one point I was trying to be so nice to the lead actress because she was beautiful. I said to her, I said, oh my God, that, that, co that color of the shirt you're wearing is so beautiful on you. Did you pick that out for yourself or do, do they just know like, and she went, thanks. And literally turned around, walked behind the set and came back in a different blouse. It was that like passive aggressive thing. And so at one point the, 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 um, the director came up to me and she said, um, you act too gay. And I said, what? And she goes, you're too gay. She said, I have gay friends and they don't act like you. And I said, well, that's funny because I am gay and I act like this all the time. Oh, 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 I did that to her. What did she do? Oh, my God, I love it. I, I don't remember, but I was not well liked on that set. And they <laughs> sabotaged. There was another actress on the show who I'm a huge fan of. And um, we were working out comedy together and they totally sabotaged our moments and so it was just not a good experience but anyway that was my first experience here in Hollywood I mean I mean this business is just full of highs and lows that's the way it is it's full of highs and lows and it's just like different every day too that was the other thing that I enjoyed but didn't like like there was not a lot of consistency but like each day there would be different people working on I don't know I miss it and then at the same time I no. No. I remember in on Will and Grace, this last time I did it, there was a, a green room where we were mm -hmm. we, we would sit and uh, relax while we weren't working. And it was right off where they keep all the uh, food. And... So that's where I knew we were supposed to hang out for that whole week. So the day of shoot, the evening of shooting the show, when I was done with my scene, uh, 
and waiting for my next scene or whatever. I went back to that room and they had transformed that room into like a VIP room. <laughs> I walk in and suddenly I'm not a VIP anymore. Aww. And they just say, oh, Coco, you're not allowed to be in this room. And I was like, what? <laughs> so it's like, again, that, you know, they keep no, you humble. They, they do keep, keep you humble. It's very true. Yeah, it's just very when true. you think you're a TV star, you know. I think they even, I mean, I have a couple of people that I know, like they even fuck with the TV stars sometimes. I mean, when they, when they complain to me, I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like yeah. you, you, you make enough money, but yeah. there, I mean, yeah, Hollywood is, listen, yeah. it's. I one time sent a video to a friend of mine who's, who's, you know, does very well and makes a lot of money and stays in the best, you know, and I, I was performing in a club in, in um, Brighton in England and mm -hmm. the dressing room was a room that was being redone there were nails all over the floor my dressing ta my dressing table where I was doing my makeup was like horse you know the horse things that you, they put a piece of wood on and and uh, sawdust everywhere and it was all oh. windows so I'm yeah. getting undressed in front of the city I, it was a disaster and I had to take a shower because I was just getting that attention in someone's apartment above the club and it was filthy you know the black all over the, oh, oh. I, I was just pushing myself because I was like, I have very limited time. I have to get to a day. But I managed to take a video of the, the, what I was dealing with. And I sent it to this. I said, if I ever hear you complain. Ever. <laughs> what should I look at this video, bitch? There has been, like, I love that you say that. Because, like, I just feel like sometimes when you're, like, uh, in those crazy places or doing that stuff, you feel like you're the only person that deals with it. It's oh, like, no. No, bitch. That's we one all of do. the best things about working with other drag queens when I get to work with other drag is that we sit around and tell the war stories of just, you know, the time I had Blood. to in a hole. Yeah. I, I talked about that in one of my shows. You know, I asked this guy, where's the bathroom? I have to go to the bathroom before I go up and do the show. He goes, there's no bathroom down here. He goes, you'd have to go upstairs and literally walk through the audience to get yeah, to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what am I going to do? He goes, well, there's a hole there. It was like a drainage hole on the floor. You can be in the hole. And so literally before my show, yeah. I'm standing <laughs> over the hole, paying into a I'm thinking, this is my life. This is, you know. You're like, I've made it. I've made it. <laughs> I mean, so you go upstairs and the audience is cheering. You're like, you just want to let them know, by the way, I just peed in a hole. Yeah. Oh, they'd be like. <laughs> yeah, I peed in, I can't tell you how many bottles of empty, I've had to finish a bottle of water just so yeah. I could then try to pee in the bottle. This is not, what, why are we talking about your- I don't, I don't know how we got here. I don't know how we got here. Um, what it's not always classy. It, no, it's not. Especially when you're like on, like whenever, it, God, when I'd get booked on location for something, I'm like, oh, please, please. Like it, it said Santa Clarita. I'm like, oh dear Lord, please make sure. It, like if it's not in the middle of the desert, please, God, please, please, please. And most of the time it wasn't, but. Thank God LA has such nice weather. Yeah. I mean, I have been on set though where it was like crazy weather. It was like psychic. Yeah, when I did uh, Dragula. Uh-huh, oh, fun. That was fun and I loved them, but um, they had us up in a cabin up in the woods, but we were filming outside and it, the temperature dropped at night. And I'm literally chattering oh, yeah. like that. And yeah, yeah, that was crazy. But you do it for your sisters. You do, you do. You have to get out there and, God, I miss doing drag shows, those were fun. There's not a drag, listen, here in Waco, Texas, there's not a single queer bar anywhere. But we got Austin and Dallas, so there yes. you have it. Um, okay, so is there anything you wanna maybe say? I don't know, I guess that's kind of corny. I was gonna say, is there anything you wanna say to like the queer community? No, I'm just joking. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Listen, I um, kids I'm keep your keep happy your to be a up. part of it. Let's just put yes, it that baby. way. I, I, you know, I, I. What was my curse growing up became my biggest blessing. Yeah, and and I wouldn't have it any other way. I've just been really. I have a landline. Do you really? I love my landline. That's um, the. Reason. I forgot to turn my phone off. 
Will you tell? Well, before you go, will you tell? It's will you tell? Spam. <laughs> before you go, will you tell us about Swanee? Swan, oh my, the swan that lived in my neighborhood. I love the story. Can you just tell us, please? You know, I grew up on an island in the Bronx. It was only a mile long, and there were swans that lived uh, around the island. And I, I learned at an early age that they sort of mate for life. And so this one must have lost its partner and was rejected. And so next thing you know, it would come, come up to our neighbor's house and literally walk into their uh, door, into the house and um, eat the dog food out of the dog dish and sit there with them. And, and they just thought it was so cute. And, and then it would walk around the neighborhood, uh, my street, and there was a big puddle. It was a <laughs> drainage problem on our street in front of another neighbor's house. So there was always a big muddy puddle in front of their home. And Swanee, which was what ended up being his name or her name, uh, would sit in that puddle. That was now its home. It was, a, it was a lake. Yeah, and then it would come, go to house to house, and you know, I'd come out with uh, bread and feed it. They're very aggressive, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. Because if I didn't get that bread out fast enough, <laughs> Swanee was like coming for me. <laughs> but yeah, it became like the neighborhood pet. pet. And uh, but I just loved that the the the, the um, Swanee would go up into our neighbor's house and and just eat out of the dog dish with the dog eating right next to it. And Aww. just, I grew up in a very funny neighborhood that was full of characters. And um, to me, it was normal. But mm -hmm. when I've been around friends and I tell stories about my neighborhood, they're like, God, it's like your neighbor. But it, it was very um, full of characters. And I think that is, I hated growing up there on some level, but the other side of that is that, um, it was, uh, um, I think it accounts for a lot of my sense of humor. Yeah. And also I was a child that loved observing. And so I was in a neighborhood where I could observe these very funny people. I actually used to think that my parents' friends on some level was, were celebrities because when they would have, like my parents would have a party, they'd all, they would all come dressed uh -huh. and they would drink a lot. I would take drink orders on my Fun. little, and then I delivered the drink orders to my dad. I also was in, my mother had a pan that she still has that you know you would pop it open and it would pop open. Big pan, decorative pan for emptying cigarettes into it. You so I'd go around the, the house entering up ashtrays. You know, and I thought it was so glamorous mm -hmm. that you know being around a bunch of drunk, well dressed, middle class. Bronx people who were hilariously. Oh, I'm sure. You know, and I'm sure it was, you know, alcohol and juice, but what did I know? I just, and I would sit there as a kid sometimes so tired, I would do this with my eyes just to try and stay awake. I oh, loved fine. being around adults. Yeah. And my aunt, like, you know, they would, my aunt Joan taught me how to curse. Curse? Yeah. Fun. She'd be like, say shit. <laughs> and then she'd, this is part of my show. She'd say, say, go. She used to tempt me or bribe me with maraschino cherries. Oh, yum. I'm so she would nice. say, say, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and I would say, and she'd go, oh, that's good. Now go say it to your mother. <gasps> I'd go say it to my mother and my, you know, my Aunt Joan would get the biggest kick out of hearing my mother yell from another room, Joan! <laughs> oh, how fun. Yeah, I'm, I I um, I had like 40 aunts and uncles and I was um, so upset when I realized they weren't really my aunts and uncles. Oh, yeah. Friends of the family. I thought we were all related. Coming over for the hooch. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, well, well I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your uh, being so supportive and I don't remember how we met, but I think we... We met on social media, and I probably I did. Was getting I, I a big kick out of your, your sort of cunty uh, comments. <laughs> well, thank you for. 
I mean, you made, you literally did what I, I mean, I'm not saying this, but like we, I think a lot of people, we did help each other out, not knowing through the pandemic because we were all, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know, but I was very like the world's ending. This is, this is it, this is it, this is it. Finding that Grand Theft Auto and then go clicking on each of them and being like, oh my God, this is like, you should, if I was out there, if I was in LA, I'd be, you, we're going to do it. I'm filming your ass. We're going, we're going to go to every place in Van Nuys. Yeah, I just wrote to my, because I used to work with a guy named Garrett Watts, who's a very well-known oh, like, yeah. to influence. He did so, Grand Theft Auto. He, yeah, so he filmed that. And a lot of those earlier ones were his idea, and they had his special, I think, touch to them. But, you know, he got busy wanting his own thing. And, um, and so uh, M Michael, my manager, and I just started making our own videos. And um, wow. I said to Michael, we should make a new video just for the hell of it um but you know people were writing to me at the height of the pandemic saying when are you going to make a new video <laughs> like people are dying like, i'm not going to stores <laughs> <laughs> oh true yeah, yeah what the fuck are you? i don't I barely yeah, go no. out to shop for food i'm so was so nervous but i think you're oh right God, really God. so many um <clears throat> of us creative people uh managed to make a living uh mm -hmm. i did it wasn't i mean i definitely didn't make what i was used to being able to make when i was out on the road but my fans came through for me mm -hmm. uh with their tips i kept my shows free online and you know because i knew people i didn't yeah. want anybody not to be able to tune into my little shows but i people were very generous with their tipping even if it was just a dollar i i was so grateful and um and I've always, I've always, I learned that in college that you have to be um, really grateful for your fans and for the other people you work with and you treat them with respect. And I also learned that from my parents. And so um, I've tried to be like that my whole career. And um, I can see now in my older age that how valuable it is to behave like that. And it's just the right way to behave. And it's just what I would do anyway. But um, it's it's definitely uh, something I tell younger people that yeah. want, want a career, that they should keep that always very focused. Yeah, I never, I, I, I need know. to respect my coworkers better, I think. <laughs> I'm sure That's they what I'm, I'm sure they love you. I mean, I'm sure some of them do, but all right. I love, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Keep making the world beautiful, darling. Do you want to tell everyone where to find you? Or do you want me to put Oh, it well, I have point? my website, which no one mm -hmm. really goes to anymore, but uh, I'm a days. But a lot of, a lot of um, people can follow me on Instagram. And, yes. and if people are still using Facebook and I'm still on Twitter, uh, but- um, <sighs> You can you can follow me at those places, and I if I have a show coming up, that's where I'll be posting about it. But also, all my information is at my website, kokapoo.com. Are you going to come to Waco, Texas, and do your show? Not Waco, but there was. If, oh, by the way, let's just mention the T-shirt that you mangled. Look at this. Look I at know you. this is not. I, how I went from being a basic basic t-shirt to like a whore and I love it but I'm sorry listen I I got it I got it a little bit bigger and I was like I love oversized and I got it I was like you know what I want it to be like 80s I wanted to put little it's like beads. very 80s I was gonna say you should put little beads on the bottom of that so it clacks well let me tell you thick. something I I wore this out one night and one of these got stuck in my booty crack so that's how long these oh well, then yeah. they need that so little miss bead, a little bead. Yeah, little just so I can feel it. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, what was I talking about? I you forgot. You were saying your website. No, I had moved on from no. that. Website. It doesn't matter. Okay. It wasn't well, important. Well, thank you for doing this. Thank you. And uh, I know we'll be in touch. This will oh, be no, out too. I was talking about. 
the tour. There was some talk oh, yeah. about coming back to Dallas and San Antonio, doing like a little tour that I had done years ago, but I don't know what happened with that. Maybe oh. my manager's still in Dallas, but I would love for that to happen because um, I love Texas. And one of the things I learned in Texas was that um, um, I think Dallas, what was it? Dallas hates Houston. Houston hates mm -hmm. Dallas. And everybody hates San Antonio. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and everybody we, loves uh, what? What's the other city? Keep it Austin. weird. Austin. Austin. Everybody Austin. loves mm -hmm. Austin. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. San Antonio's not so bad, but I love San Antonio. I thought San Antonio was great. Really charming, and I had a really yeah. sweet audience there in in the middle of nowhere. But I loved it. Oh, All yeah, right, if you do. I'm coming. So yes, you better. All right, my love. Friday morning. All right, look at you. All these lights, girl. It's about to all come off. I'm going to go to the grocery store. All right, we'll wrap it up. Goodbye, sweetheart. Smooches. Thank you. Good luck at the grocery store. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.